Luke chapter 10. And as you're looking up Luke chapter 10, a few years ago, there was a story that came out on the television of a little boy by the name of Robert Turner, and he found his mom passed out on the floor. So he called 911, and he said, please, you need to send an ambulance over here immediately. My mom's sick. I can't wake her up. And the 911 operator kept saying, oh my gosh, quit playing games, little boy, and hung up on him. And he called back again, and the same operator answered. And she said, I'm tired of playing with you. And she hung up again on him a second time. This time he called a third time, got a different dispatcher. Now, he was a little five-year-old boy, so you got to understand, think as a dispatcher, you got a five-year-old kid, is this kid really for real, is he? But he goes, please, my mama can't wake up, please, please. And she goes, look, little boy, I hope you're not joking, but I'm sending the police right now. And that dispatcher sent the police. And they got there too late because his mom died. The first dispatcher was found guilty of negligence because she failed to do her job. When I heard that story, it grieved me. And then I said, that'll preach. Because you and I are God's 911. He puts people in front of us all the time. People that are dying, people that are hurting, people that are broken, people that need an emergency, they need to be shocked and padded with pads, boom, back to life, but the pads of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That you and I would have our eyes open and start seeing these people because they're around us every place. Every place. And you know what's sad? Is we know how to zone them out we know how to be at a stop sign or at a traffic light and not even see the guy there holding a sign now i know some are scam artists and others are legit but the reality is you and i know how to zone people out that we don't want to see because sometimes we don't want to get involved and we don't want to be inconvenienced and we don't want to and we don't want to and we don't want to yet they're right in front of us and they need jesus amen and you and I are the hands and feet and mouth and ears of who? Jesus. We are the body of Christ. He is the head, but we are the body. And you and I are the ones that are going to change the world. And you and I are the ones that are going to impact it. And you and I are the ones that's going to live out a radical, outrageous faith to the glory of God. So tonight what I want to talk about is outrageous opportunities opportunities God gives us to impact people, touch people's lives, help them with the gospel of Christ. When they need us the most, we're going to be there. Luke chapter 10, starting at verse 25 through verse 30. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question, teacher, now hear me, he's trying to test him. So hear the arrogance, because he's a religious leader. Can you hear him almost, teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Don't you want to just slap somebody like that? <laughs> Jesus replied, now he's a religious teacher. So look how cool Jesus is. What does the law of Moses say? Like, hey, smart aleck, you're an expert. What does the law say? How do you read it? But see, now you see, first, what does the law say? But how do you read it? The Bible is written very clear, yet you and I kind of maneuver it to accommodate us. Amen? And it says, love your neighbor. Amen? It even says, love your enemies. 
Well, let's really, let's, I, what did Jesus really mean by that? Because it doesn't feel comfortable. Well, so back to the story. Verse 26, how do you read it? Verse 27, the man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes, right. Now see, because I see the Bible a whole different way, I see Jesus almost, right, ding, 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 you got the answer, yeah, right. <laughs> he goes, right, Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. Any of you ever tried to justify your actions? No, not, not this service. I'm sure the people that come on Sunday, they do. Wednesday night, we don't try to justify our actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Can you hear that smart alecky remark? His little smart aleck like, well, who's my neighbor? Jesus said, replied with a story. This Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho when he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, left him half dead beside the road. Heavenly Father, help us tonight to open up our eyes and see the outrageous opportunities that you place before us so that we could change the world. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You got to understand, they're walking, they're walking from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, those of us that went to the Holy Land last year know that we went on that road. It's an 18-mile road, but they weren't on a bus like us. So they're walking 18 miles. That's a good distance, but people walked it every day. So it was very commonly trafficked. Just like today, in our day and age now, if you go on that road, there's a lot of traffic on that road because people still go from Jerusalem to Jericho all the time. Now they're going and coming, and you've got to understand, it's very, very mountainous there. And it's desert. They're not like mountains like ours that have vegetation and rocks. They're all just huge mountains, but it's like almost like huge sand dunes, but they're real, real large. And the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is all downhill. We don't know, you know, we, we just know that he's going and he's on the road and he's, and he's traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. So he's going downhill but even to this day, there's a lot of thieves on that road. And there were a lot of thieves back then. So for people to get mugged and people to get robbed, it was common. It, it wasn't an unusual thing. So when he's telling the story, they can relate to it like, yeah, this guy got mugged. Yeah, man, a lot of people got mugged. Yeah, my uncle got mugged. My, I've been mugged. You know, they can, they can relate. And so he's saying... That this guy got mugged, but they stripped him of everything. They stripped him of everything. They took away all he had. So they're relating, man. They're connecting. And he's got their attention. And he says, I want you to see life differently. You see, when you and I when we start seeing the world the way Jesus does, we're going to be able to make a big difference in this world. Because we don't see life through Jesus' eyes a lot of times. We judge and we gauge and we look at and we play the, I don't know, and maybe so, and I don't know, oh, and just forget it. And, and, and man, G Jesus could see through the fake and the fraud, but you know what? Jesus saw the need. We need to see the crowds as Jesus saw the crowds. So how can we see differently? Well, I'm glad you asked. Four things I want to talk about tonight. Number one, we need to see the outrageous opportunities that God presents to us in our heartaches. 
When there's pain in our life, when there's pain in someone's life, it is one of the greatest opportunities for you to either be ministered to or to minister to somebody. Because you are broken, you are hurting, you are overwhelmed, because life can be overwhelming. See, we don't understand. We say, how in the world, golly God, if you love me so much, why is there so much pain in the world? He told you, in this world, there will be a lot of trials and tribulations. There's going to be overwhelming pain. There's going to be overwhelming journey. But I'm going to tell you something. Do not fear because I am with you. You aren't alone. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So hold on to that. Don't let go of that. But he says, in this world, we have a ruler of this world, and his name is Satan, and he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. He has no mercy. He doesn't share mercy. So you better understand that when life is overwhelming, it's because you live on earth. Life is overwhelming. He never said it was going to be hunky-dory. But he did say, be of good cheer because I'm with you. And we ought to have joy because of that. And that, see, we don't even understand what joy is. We think joy is, ooh, yeah, ooh, how cool. We're going to Disneyland. That's what we think joy is. We think joy is, ee, ee, we're going to go to the buffet, all you can eat. After church, we're going to the village in for free pie. That's not joy. That's happiness. Happiness comes and goes. Joy is there in the darkest times and in the greatest times because joy is God's presence and assurance that he is with you. <laughs> and when you know he's with you, you go, you know what? I'm going to get through this. The light at the end of the tunnel isn't a train coming at me. It's hope. It's called God is going to give me my breakthrough. I'm going to see through. He's going to carry me. He's going to carry me. He's going to carry me. Every day we see and hear people's heartaches right in front of us. Look, at your workplace, what do you say to your friends sometimes? Hey, what's up? How's it going? Oh, you don't, don't even ask. What do you usually say? What happened? Ah, oh, you don't understand, man. My, uh, my wife, dude, she got a, she got a stupid why idea. Went to the mall and spent three hundred dollars on one dress. We didn't have the money, and uh. and instead of you ministering, you just go, yeah, well, women could be dumb. My husband, he went to Sportsman Guide and spent $300 on, on a weapon we didn't even need and we didn't have the money for. Yeah, men could be dumb. Instead of saying, man, I'm sorry to hear that. Let me pray with you. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me tell you something. Let me, let me help you through that. Let me encourage you. Let me give you a word so that you can be encouraged and not go and shoot your wife or shoot your husband and say, this is it. It's over but find healing. Are you with me? There's people that you see, you saw them today. Oh, pray for me, my son. Oh my gosh. Oh, my daughter, they got ex she got expelled from school again. He got expelled. What am I going to do? You're going to encourage them. You're going to pray with them and you're going to tell them your story when you were an idiot and you got expelled and you ended up graduating and now you're doing amazing because Jesus Christ turned your life around and he gave you a 180 and now you're serving God. Am I communicating to anybody today? He gives us outrageous opportunities for the heartache in life. Look what he says in Matthew, um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 through 38. Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages in that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing that the good news about the kingdom of God, and he healed every kind of disease and illness. Verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. 
Ask him to send more workers into the field. Let's just pray that right now. Heavenly Father, we're praying right now to the Lord of the harvest. We need more workers here at New Beginnings Church to get fired up and wired up to do the work of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And that's what he told the disciples to do. He said, come on, start praying. Start making a difference. Start seeing what God's doing. He saw with eyes of hope. He saw with eyes of the Lord. He saw with eyes in the midst of the brokenness. The brokenness that was right in front of him. He says, who's your neighbor? Let me tell you about this guy that's going down the road. And he sees a Jewish guy there who had been beaten. He was robbed. They left him naked. They took all his clothes. Let me ask you something. If someone beat you up, it's already sad enough that you got beat up. But if they left you naked on the side of the road, all your dignity's gone. You're sitting there naked. It's like, man, really this too? How embarrassing. Come on. They took his dignity. They took his money. They took all his money, everything, he, his watch, his wedding ring, his bracelet, his necklace. They took everything. They took his Jordans, they took his belt, they took everything. He's sitting there, he's broken hearted, he's naked, he's in pain. They left him for dead. This guy might even barely have a, a pulse. He's groaning, he's hurting. They took everything. They took his health. Have you ever been there where they take your pride, they take your health, they take everything you have, and you're like, man, I don't have anything left. But he goes, you got me, buddy. I'm not going to leave you. God is showing me right now that I have an outrageous opportunity to minister to you in your brokenness. You and I have many of those opportunities every day of our life. Man, do you remember what he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8? And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses. Telling people, telling people, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, that's in Albuquerque. In Judea, that's in Bernalillo County. In Samaria, uh, Samaria, that's like New Mexico. And the uttermost parts of the world. That's like the United States and beyond. Outrageous opportunities. Man, I got three more points. I better get with the program. (laughs) Second thing I want to say. We need to see outrageous opportunities are sometimes divine appointments yes, amen. that bring some inconvenience. Let me tell you something. This guy's on his way. He's working. He's working. He's on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho, and all of a sudden, he sees a guy broken. He sees a guy hurting. He sees a guy in need. Have you ever stopped to help somebody? It messes up your schedule. (laughs) You're like, dude, I gotta go. I gotta go. But God says, I want you to help him. Come on, hurry up. (laughs) No, he stopped and goes, dude, get up on the donkey. He couldn't get up. So first he's getting oil and wine and he's pouring it into him and getting him some drink and he's putting balm on him got his handkerchief out and he's going, dude, they messed you up. You could just hear him praying. You could hear him praying and saying, God, poor dude. Dude, who did this to you? Were you ranked into a gang or something? Did you mess up with somebody's wife? Did your kids beat you up? Are your finances out of control? Are you you connecting with me? He's broken. 
What are you broken about? That's you. How many people came across your path just today and you didn't have time? You didn't take time because it was going to inconvenience you. Matthew 20, 30 says, two blind men were sitting beside the road and they heard that Jesus was coming their way as they began shouting. Now they're blind. They just heard, hey, there comes that Jesus, the one that heals people. There comes that Jesus, the miracle worker. There comes that Jesus, the one that meets your every need. There comes that Jesus. And so they, they didn't even know which, which way. They just know he's coming. So they started screaming, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. They're like, anyone? Yell, yell again, dude, yell again. Lord, can you just hear them yelling? They're saying, please. Please hear me, hear me, hear me. How many people have asked you, hear me, hear me, hear me, and you gave them a deaf ear? Please, I'm right here. Please. God will bless you. You know what? One time this guy calls me up. I had met him in Casper, Wyoming. And they had gone through a big... When, when the market crashed and all that hit, anyway, this guy was going to come to Albuquerque, and we had met out there, and he goes, hey, Richard, I'm coming to Albuquerque. I lost my job. We're about to lose everything, and uh, man, I, I, I know I don't even know you that well, but would you and Cindy allow me to stay at your house a few days? I go, yeah, dude, come on, and stayed at our house, and, and, uh, and, and he's going, how are things going? And I was all wired up, and I'm like, Oh my gosh, dude, we were at the old church and it was a small little building and it, it, was a, it was a tiny little house and we had already added on that and now we were going to add more on and, and I go, man, I'm, we're going to add on to the building. I have this dream and man, and I, I, I got my pencil and paper out and I go, here's the building and I don't know how to draw but you know, I, I drew the best I could and I go, we're going to add on here, man, pray for me and he goes, do you have anyone to do that? No, man, I got to need to get an architect or something. He goes, well, Richard, do you know what I do for a living? I'm a draftsman. I, I draw up all the plans, and then the architect takes them and takes them to a whole nother level. I'm like, no way, dude. He goes, I'll draw those for you. I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> I, I gave up a little bit of my time, and a, I gave up a room, and, and, and God blessed so then, now I had my plans. And every place I'd go, I had my plans. Because the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. Amen. So I had my plans with me. I took them every place. And I had flown to Indiana, and I'm coming back, and I'm sitting next to this man, and all of a sudden, <coughs> this man goes. And I was so tired. I've been in meetings every day and hours. And, and this man's walking up the aisle, and he's all walking kind of like this. And I said, oh, that guy's going to want to sit next to me and probably talk. And he sat there and he goes, how you doing? And his wife literally said, oh, if you're going to talk, I'm going to the back of the plane. And I was there, can I go with you? You know, it's like, so he sits next to me and he goes, man, he goes, where are you from? I go, Albuquerque. He's like, I'm from Albuquerque. And he goes, he goes, man, I've been gone for six months. I've been studying uh, in, in Europe. And I go, wow, that's awesome. And we're, so we're talking, and he goes, so what's been happening for the last six months? So I'm, lit, I'm not, you know, tell him all this stuff about Albuquerque and stuff that's been happening. He's like, oh, okay, good, bad, and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, so he goes, so what do you do? I go, I'm a pastor in the South Valley. Wow, okay. And then I go, so what do you do? Guess what he did? was? An architect. And I go, wow. I, so when he goes, I'm an architect, I go, praise the Lord. He goes, no one's ever said that because I'm an architect. I go, well, man. I go, I happen to have some plans. And I took my plans out. And I go, I need someone to draw this up. I go, I want to add on to our church. And I need someone to draw this up for free. You have not because you ask not. See, he gave me an outrageous opportunity, but it inconvenienced me a little bit. So guess what he was? He was the dean of the School of Architecture for UNM. 
So he assigned one of his seniors to do the artwork for us for free. So then, now I'm walking around with my blueprints every place. And guess who I ran into and met? A missionary construction worker that he goes all over the country and all around the world and he came from Canada all the way to Southside Church of God on the South Valley and he added on our building for free. All because I chose to help this one guy who helped another, 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 another. I'm telling you, God is giving you opportunities. You got to take advantage of them. Amen? Amen? Let's finish up. Let's finish up. Let's finish up. Because I got two more points. <laughs> and I only have about 12 minutes, okay? So someone's timing me. Oh, 12 minutes. Ushers, get that guy out of here. Okay. <laughs> so the third thing I'm going to say is that you and I need to open our eyes because we need to see the outrageous opportunities of what can be done instead of what can't be done. Amen? Did you hear what I said? Have your eyes open as to what can be done instead of what can't be done. There's an old Chinese proverb that says, let him who is doing it not be interrupted by the one who says it cannot be done. <laughs> Haven't you ever seen that to be true? You're here working away. Well, you can't do that. You can't. Well, we already did it. We already finished. We're celebrating. But that can't be done. It did. I don't know how you did it. Neither do I. What's impossible for man is possible for God. Because all things are possible to him that believes. Do you believe? You know what? I share all these stories. The other day I was sharing a bunch of stories how God blessed us with a car and then gave me a station wagon and then I traded it for a van and then I blew them over but somebody gave me a motor before I got the van. Blow. You remember that? And you know what? This one lady told another lady, oh sure, like if that really happened. <laughs> I can verify it. So if you don't believe it, I know, they're hard to believe. But how many of you know we serve an outrageous God that is wild, radical, hard to believe? And now back to the sermon, already in progress. Look what it says in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 5. Jesus soon saw a large crowd of people coming to look for him. Pointing to Philip, he asked, where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Ah, oh, I know where to get it. Get it from Tomas. He gets us bread every Wednesday. <laughs> we love you, Tomas. Thank you, brother. Tomas, raise your hand. That's the guy that gets us the bread every, every Wednesday. Where can we get enough bread to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, even if we work for months, we won't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Hey, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. <laughs> but... <laughs> What good is that with this huge crowd? There's 5,000 men. It doesn't say how many women are there. I don't mean this to be funny or to be rude. Women didn't count in those days. So they didn't count the women. And children didn't count. Because they were like annoying. So, so we don't know how many... W <laughs> well, they're not annoying now. No, no. That's why they're in children's church. <laughs> And we're going, hallelujah. <laughs> that's messed up, you know. But I'm being serious. That's why we really have children's church and we even have a family room. Because how many of you know that the devil will use a baby to disrupt? And when God has a word for you, you're distracted. So anyway, we have 5,000 men 
And let's just say each man just had, only half of the men there had their wife with them. So that's 2,500 women. And let's say the average family back in those days, they had about five kids. But let's even just say they had two kids with them. So that's another 5,000. So there were anywhere from 12,000 to 15,000 people there that day. And here comes Andrew. Lord, I found this kid with a sack lunch. We don't know how young the boy was, but it says a young boy. It doesn't say a young man. So he was a little boy. So his, he probably said, Mama, I'm going to go listen to that Jesus guy. He's really good. Here, mijito. Come here, mijo. Here, here's some little fish like sardines. And here's some bread, mijito. That way you'll have something to eat. And they take this kid's lunch. <laughs> Pobrecito. Andrew, come here, kid. Come here. Hey, the master needs your lunch. Lord, we, we found the lunch. I found some lunch. Oh, uh, never mind. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> Hear me. Jesus said, way to go, Andrew. I know you're backtracking right now, but way to go, Andrew. You stepped out and you brought me something, and then you kind of backtracked like, what good is this? But it's good. So sit them all down in groups of tens, five tens, twenties, and hundreds, fifties. And then God blessed the food and they fed everybody. Only God can do stuff like that. Only God. We need to start being different about things. You know, we need to start helping people. Not too long ago, I was driving, and a guy had broke down, and, and I see him, he's like this, by his car, and I, I pulled up, and I go, hey, dude, you need some help? Dude, I need to get to the hospital right away, please, I need to get to the hospital. I go, what about your car? So we pushed the car out of the way, and I rushed him over. I go, I'm going that way. So I dropped him off at UNMH, and I said, God bless you, brother. Man, thank you. And but while we were driving, he goes, dude, thanks for doing this, man. Who are you? And I go, hey, my name's Richard, and I happen to be pastor. He called me up the next day. He goes, are you the pastor that helped me? I go, yeah. He goes, thank you. And he's crying his head off. He goes, I got to get there in time to say goodbye to my mom. She died. I was heartbroken, but I was so thankful that I took time to help him. How many times do we overlook that? How many times do we miss it? Let's finish. Fourth thing I want to say. That we need to see the outrageous opportunities. Our simple acts of kindness that are a miracle to those we touch. They're a miracle. They're a miracle. That guy needed a ride. I never thought I was going to bless him like that. For him, it was a miracle that I stopped. For me, it was just one of those moments that God gave that I was showing an act of kindness. You ever just been nice just because God told you? You ever been standing there and God says, pay for that guy's food? He's like, really? Yeah, pay for it. And I go, I don't say, hey, let me pay for your food. I'll just tell the clerk, let me pay for his food. And they go, okay. So I pay for him. And then I'll leave, and sometimes they run outside. Hey, wait up, sir. Why did you do that? <laughs> just to say, God bless you. Thank you so much. I didn't have food to eat. And now, well, you want more? No, but now I have money to put in my car. So he was going to put his $7 in the car. You ever been there? You ever been there where you're checking the ashtray and getting all the coins? <laughs> and you're getting your coin jar at the house, whatever you throw your coins in? Cindy has a little jar called a Jericho jar. I bought it in Jericho when I went. And she throws it in her Jericho all loose change. Sometimes my grandsons, Grandma, do you happen to have 
some quarters. Orale, here, how many of you? She goes to the Jericho jar. You ever been in your Jericho jar and you're there looking for money to put? Man, just be a blessing to somebody. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 14 through 17, he says, above all, clothe yourself with love. Let me just stop right there. Now, I'm a visual person, so I'm looking in the closet. What should I wear today? Oh, clothe yourself with love. Okay, love. Put on love. Which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And then let peace. The Bible says when we put on the full armor of God, we put on the shoes of peace. So God, let me walk in peace today. Let me not be a pelionero or a pelionera, a feisty one. Pelionero or pelionera, for you all that don't understand Spanish, I mean, someone that's always stirring it up. You know anybody like that? They're always, they're like, oh my gosh, why are you always fighting with me? They're always stirring it up, stirring it up, stirring. You're like, oh my gosh. Let peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. And as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its riches fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. So he's saying use God's wisdom. Minister with that. In other words, show kindness. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Aren't you glad God loves our singing even if we don't even love our own singing? <laughs> Have you ever been singing and you go, man, I sing horrible. Sometimes I think I'm all bad and I'm there singing away. <laughs> and other times I go, oh my gosh, I can't even stand myself. And God goes, that's all right, I love it. Amen. Have you ever just sang a song to God just because you love him? You just make it up. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love God. Uh, you know, and you're like, and God's going, <sighs> he inhabits the praise of his people. Sing them with thankful hearts. And I want you to read this with me. We're not in a race. We're going to read it nice and slow, but I want everyone to read it. Here we go. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So he says what? Whatever you do or whatever you say, do as a representative of Christ. So whatever you do or say, you're representing Jesus. So when you're there telling someone how awesome they are, you're doing it as a representative of Jesus. But if you're cussing someone out or you're flipping them off, you're doing it as a representative of Jesus. Man, that's heavy, isn't it? Ay carambas. Some of you are going, oh Lord. Oh my gosh, they're sitting in the same pew with me and we were fighting over the same parking lot, <laughs> parking space. Ay, ay, ay. Listen to me, church. God wants to give us outrageous opportunities for us to serve him, amen? amen. So are you going to take advantage of it? Yes. Are you going to take advantage of it? Yes. Yeah, do it. Let's do it. Let's stand to our feet and worship him. And say thank you to God for what he's doing in our life. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us amazing opportunities, Lord. Outrageous opportunities to serve you. To, Father God, be able to just minister to people in their heartache. To be inconvenienced, but know that we are impacting people for all of eternity. And Heavenly Father, that we truly would keep doing the work, even when others are saying it can't be done, to the glory of your name. We are going to show kindness and mercy and love. Amen and amen. Sing it out. Sing it out. Sing it out. I need you.
we just talked about it to open my eyes Say it, all I am, all I, am. I surrender. I surrender. Sing it as 